to speak for a religion and its authentic claims. In today's video, we're going to find out why that is not the job of the scholar of religion. It's your introduction to religious studies, and it's coming up right now. We need to talk. As scholars of religion and culture, you're going to find that there are a lot of commentators and pundits out there that are going to draw lines around what they see as a group's authentic expressions versus a group's inauthentic expressions. What do I mean by that? One day you turn on the news or you're looking at your social media feed and say you see a group who's been said to have practiced an act of terror. They have done something violent. When you look at that group a little bit more closely and what they say and how they present themselves, you find that they are using language that's not dissimilar to the language you use to identify yourself. Maybe they practice the same religion. Maybe they belong to the same political party. Maybe they stand for the same economic or government principles. But then you want to draw a line and say, whoa, 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 I'm not with them. They don't speak for me. They have hijacked what I do. What we're doing when that happens is we're making a claim about authenticity. We're saying that what we practice is the real thing and what they practice is the inauthentic, fake, charlatan thing that doesn't represent accurately what we think we are all about or what our group is all about. Historian of religion Bruce Lincoln talks about this in terms of playing cheerleaders, playing favorites. We as scholars of religion do not have the luxury to play cheerleader to any group. Even if you practice a religion um, or belong to a per certain political party or identify with some certain group, as scholars of religion and culture, our job is to analyze people. We are not here to play cheerleader. We are here to play analyst. Now, for, for the study of religion and culture, that means we have to get really good at sussing out these claims of authenticity. And the way to do that is to examine the discourse, to break down the expressions and the effects. Jean-Francois Bayard, that scholar, philosopher who told us about identity not really existing, but being rather the product of operational acts of identification, he says, need it be said that determining the criteria for what is or is not authentic is always problematic? Put differently, doesn't it stand to reason that drawing a line between authentic and inauthentic claims is a problem that is political, that already incorporates bias into our making sense of the world. Aaron Hughes is another scholar of religion who says, it's very common to see people drawing lines between um, what is an authentic expression of religion versus a hijacked one. He, he looks at this in particular around um, the question of is Islam peaceful? And what he says is that question is the wrong question to ask because there's a whole issue about who gets to identify what an authentic Muslim is and what makes for authentic practice. No one goes around the world trying to say we're going to practice violence. Violence is an expression that's in the eye of the beholder. It's a matter of classification. He says instead that we need to look at how groups argue over their identity in order to... Um, gather political um, authority, to present themselves as authentic, to show that their ideology is valid versus and over and against other groups. That is our job as scholars of religion. It's not to assess who has the authentic claim versus who doesn't. It's to make sense of how they are arguing to jockey for position in the social construction of reality. So as scholars of religion, how can we make sense of these expressions of authenticity. Because let's face it, we're all part of groups. We all identify with different social positions. But when we put on that scholarly hat, we need to keep it real. And that means we've got to deconstruct how authenticity works. And I'm going to show you how. In breaking down authenticity, we need to recognize that what we are observing as scholars of religion and culture is something that's quite active and dynamic. We can't take it for granted as a sort of a passive presence. We present an explanation of what people are about. We need to look at who, first and foremost, is identified. So that's part one, okay? 
Then part two is by whom that's part three there are two for what part three and part four is with what social effects So, just to give you an example here, if we are looking at a discourse in action, particularly an authenticity claim, we need to recognize that it's not enough to just say that um, Islam is violent, right? That doesn't, you can't draw that picture. You can't present that idea just as I phrased it and expect it to mean much to people unless they already agree with you, in which case you're cheerleading then, right? And Bruce Lincoln says, no, 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 that doesn't work. Aaron Hughes is telling us that to present an idea as passive, Muslims are violent, Muslims aren't violent, are Muslims violent, that's all passive. That doesn't do anything for us as scholars of religion. What we need to be doing is unpacking how people are identifying and how people are laying claim to sort of discourse of authenticity to make sense of themselves and the world around them. So what does that look like? It means asking who is identified by whom, for what, with what social effects. So who is identified? Let's use as our example, Muslims. Okay, Muslims are identified by whom? Let's say, um, uh, some Americans uh, for what, right? So Muslims are identified by some Americans for what? Uh, being violent as being violent with what social effects? Um, thus being terrorists. Now, when we lay out that some Americans identify Muslims as being violent and thus being terrorists, we can then begin to look at that discourse and see what that does, right? Um, you could use that projected hidden essence model that Martin pre uh, presented us with earlier about essentialism to sort of unpack how that happens, right? There are all these additional characteristics. They're violent, they come from a civilization that seems to be uh, against the West and thus violent. They don't believe in Jesus. They, uh, there are Muslims that committed 9-11, right? All of these thus say, therefore Muslims should be labeled as violent and not trusted in society, be designated as terrorists, not be allowed to be citizens, they are enemies, right? All these social roles get attached to them. We can begin to examine how that works with so much richer description when we use the active voice in our explanations and don't take for granted passive authenticity claims. We also can look at the limits and the politics and bias involved in drawing lines of identity in the way that we present here in the chart, right? You can see all sorts of group bias in what I put on this chart. You can see all sorts of um, sort of ethnocentrism and Christocentrism present in there as well. And this doesn't mean you have to deny that some Muslims participated in the 9-11 attacks, but what it does mean is you have to look at the, the constraints of the expression and to what extent it works as scholarly analysis versus cheerleading and politics. Now, don't get it twisted. This whole discussion of authenticity doesn't mean that you cannot belong to a group, that you cannot have a point of view. Every scholar of religion and culture knows that human beings have a point of view. But as scholars, our job is to understand how people enact those points of view in order to fit into society and make sense of the world around them, how it impacts other people and how it allows them to connect and disconnect with others too and how it shapes the world around them such that they forget that the world is a product of our construction. The study of religion and culture gives you the tools to understand how it works. Seeing its pieces and what people do with those pieces 
to make a whole complex that will keep us busy for quite a long time. It may not be a job for us to determine who is authentically part of a group and who is not, but it is our job to make sense of this world where people care about what makes one authentically part of a group or not. And that job is not gonna be finished anytime soon. So.